So, hey, welcome to 2023. This is uh, my first official recording of the new year. Welcome back to Accelerated Investor. I'm your host, Josh Cantwell. And today we're going to talk about multifamily insurance. We're going to talk specifically to Calvin Roberts. He is uh, one of the executives at Falcon Insurance Agency. And we're specifically going to talk about why right now is one of the hardest times in history to quote insurance, um, specifically because insurance companies, it's a seller's market. Insurance companies are strong arming their pricing. And that's because number one of record inflation, which has to do with all the money printing that happened over COVID. But number two, the frequency of catastrophic events that are happening like hurricanes, tornadoes, freeze events, and things like that. So we're going to talk about number one, what you should be budgeting for your insurance when you buy a multifamily building, how much per unit per year should you be budgeting? That's number one. Number two, we're going to talk about what's called a tenant liability master policy. Number three, we're going to talk about how to become an actual owner in a brokerage agency, an owner in a in a, an insurance company that can actually profit from selling insurance to your residents. Okay. So we're going to talk very high level of what's called a captive agency for this tenant liability master policy. And then we're also going to talk about transfer of risk. Number four, where we can actually transfer the risk for vehicles, transfer the risk for general contractors out of our hands and over to our residents and over to our general contractors to make sure that we're as insulated as possible with our buildings, with our grounds, with our parking lots, and everything that goes into that. So this is a fantastic conversation with Calvin Roberts from Falcon Insurance. Here we go. Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you're looking to retire early with forever passive income, you're in the right place. This podcast is the go-to destination for real estate investors, both active and passive, and multifamily apartment investors, both new, intermediate, and advanced. Now, sit back, listen, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. So, hey, Calvin, listen, welcome to the first recording of 2023 on Accelerated Investor. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you again very much for having me, Josh. I'm very much looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, you too. You too. So, Calvin, as we start 2023, um, tell our audience a little bit about where you're at with your investing. Uh, tell us about your recent successes and what do you think 2023 has in store for you? Perfect. So my name is Calvin Roberts. I'm the principal of Falcon Insurance Agency of Michigan. We're a national boutique commercial insurance brokerage specializing in serving real estate investors. We take on, as I joke, anything with four walls. So, you know, <laughs> we we love multifamily, commercial real estate, rental, one to four family, Airbnb, hotels, really anything where there is a, a solid structure. We're very experienced and knowledgeable and bring a lot to the table for real estate investors. And for myself personally, I am finally getting into the real estate game later this year. I'm planning on embarking my journey with a Ann Arbor off-campus house hack, get a, you know, maybe four or five bedroom off-campus and work on scaling up from there. Did you say Ann Arbor? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, we have to stop this uh, recording. <laughs> investing in the University of Michigan. <laughs> for me, my friends, my students, my investors, or anybody on the show. So show's <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Ohio State and Michigan. I, unfortunately, both just lost in the yeah. college semifinals. Both in amazing fashion. Both games were really, really well played. In Michigan, obviously, is a, is a beautiful, amazing campus. Great place to invest. Um, so, Kevin, talk to us about insurance and how it's changed. Obviously, with the cost of so many things going up, mm -hmm. the cost of just everything with inflation, the cost of lumber went up hundreds of percent, the cost of so many things went up. Now things start to be leveling off a little bit. Inflation's starting to temper a little bit. However, it's made everything more expensive to buy, which means it makes everything more expensive to insure. So much so, and I'll just tell you a quick story, Calvin. I bought a building back in 
uh, April of 2022 mm-hmm. uh, for 16.3 million. The replacement cost was 42 million. So our insurance is actually almost double, not quite, but almost double what we underwrote for. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to have to, you know, we're going to have to you know, continue to fix up the building and then try to get that cost down over time. But it's probably never going to go back down to what we thought it would be originally simply because insurance costs have gone up. So talk to our audience about what's evolved and changed, especially over the last couple of years with COVID, inflation. What should our investors be looking out for? And what kind of advice can you give them? So right now we are entering and midway are into what I see described as the hardest insurance marketplace in history. And what a hard market means is it's, for a simple explanation, uh, a seller's market Insurance companies are able to dictate terms, strong arm pricing. It's been a a less friendly environment for the real estate investor over the last three or four years. And this is being driven by several factors. You know, the first, as you mentioned, inflation, it's been it's been challenging for insurance companies. Because if let's say you I'll throw an example scenario here. Let's say you're expecting to pay on a you know, account or a portfolio of accounts where the average building size is $1 million. That's what you've underwritten the premium for. You're expecting to pay out 500,000 in claims across a one year period. And because of inflation, drastically increasing the actual rebuild and replacement costs of these properties. When the claim happens, let's say you actually are forced to cut a check for 700,000. Well, in doing so, you know, you have to make that money back somewhere. And that comes in the form of increased insurance premiums for all of us. Mm -hmm. In addition to inflation, you have factors such as uh, increasing frequency and scale and scope of catastrophic loss events. You know, the hurricanes that we saw earlier this year in Florida, you know, the wildfires that have been happening more frequently out west. And, you know, like we've just had over the last several weeks the freeze events that have continued to occur in recent years, they are, they're causing a greater than anticipated catastrophic loss experience for the property insurance industry. And what that means is each insurance company generally has what's called reinsurance. So let's say you're State Farm and you don't want to have crazy large reserves. You want to use your capital in the most efficient and effective means possible, rather than having $10 billion tucked away in a, you know, savings account, so to speak, you might have $5 billion in reserves, and then you purchase reinsurance so that if, let's say, during one season, we have more than $5 billion in hurricane losses, we as the insurance company know that we have our own insurance that would respond and settle those losses, mm-hmm. allowing for the most efficient use of capital throughout the insurance industry. So you're paying up to essentially a stop loss, right? That insurance Correct. company knows that they're going to cover X amount. They're essentially the first line of defense, the first line of insurance. And then they're getting reinsured by some other insurance company who's willing to take on additional risk. Um, and so if you look at inflation and just the cost of things going up, you look at the frequency of these catastrophic events. Um, you look at replacement cost of older buildings, older buildings, you know, that maybe are not trading for 42 million, like that building I bought, but in order to rebuild the entire structure would cost 42 million Mm -hmm. makes insurance cost more. Is there a number? I'm curious, Calvin, if you were underwriting an apartment deal, a Mm -hmm. family apartment deal, a a lot of people like rules of thumb or shortcuts. Is there a, a, a per year per unit like number mm-hmm. that people use. So I had used, I was using about $300 in the past per unit or 25 bucks a month, mm-hmm. $300 a year per unit as my kind of rule of thumb for underwriting. Then I would adjust it based on quotes we would get and things. Recently I've moved that up to 350. Mm-hmm. You know, is, is, am, is that in line? Do you see that going forward or changing? Do you see that going up even further or is that going to stay for a while? I would expect it to continue increasing in coming years. Mm -hmm. And it's primarily being driven by, you know, inflation, but also the fact that reinsurance 
you know, I was just reading an article last weekend that the expected cost of property reinsurance going into 2023, when the most reinsurance treaties have renewals either on 1-1 or on 7-1, so twice a year, they're staggered. I'm expecting to see a 50% increase in the cost of reinsurance at our upcoming treaty renewal this summer. Wow, okay. So it's unfortunately here to stay for at least the short and most likely medium term where, you know, it's also very driven by which market you are operating and investing in. So in some place like the upper Midwest, it's going to be a lot more stable than if you're in places like the U.S. Southeast, especially if you're in a coastal affected region. And this is due to, you know, those catastrophic loss events. And, you know, sure, in Michigan, we might get hailstorms, we might get, you know, tornadoes, and of course, the occasional fire, but we're not going to be hit by a hurricane. So we have that working for us. And I would generally agree with your 350 per door assessment on an annual basis in probably around half of the United States. So that's for the Midwestern markets, the middle of the country that are not as subject to these catastrophic events. How about those markets where there are catastrophic events? What what should people be underwriting for? Is it double? Is it 50% more? Depends which market specifically. So if we're talking the U.S. Southeast outside of the coast, so you're at least 75 miles inland, I would expect to see maybe between 5 and 650 per door. So, you know, maybe... Charlotte, North Carolina, or, you know, inland Georgia. Georgia, That kind of market. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, places like Florida, I mean, you can quadruple that 350 per door. I would expect to see between 1,000 and 1,500 per door in the vast majority of Florida. And certain regions in Florida are more closely affected by increase in price than other regions, you know. Miami-Dade County has been taking very sizable increases in the cost of property insurance in recent years. But if you're talking Orlando, you know, you're a lot less susceptible to that hurricane risk and overall have a better loss experience. It's going to be less abrasive, one could say. Yeah. So what kind of, so outside of the, you know, property insurance that you buy, mm-hmm. um, if you were insuring someone like me, so I'm asking this for selfish reasons, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we own about 3,000 units. We've had as many as 4,400. We sold off about 13, 1,400 units um, in 2021, mm-hmm. which was great. But we have about 3,000 units. Uh, we also own a construction company that does a lot of our unit turns and uh, common spaces and exterior renovations, exterior paint. Uh, boilers, that kind of stuff. We do that in house, actually, mm-hmm. or we sub it out. You know, if it's if it's a specialty thing like a boiler, um, so we have that kind of risk as well mm-hmm. uh, in the construction company. Uh, a lot of our members and listeners have a very similar setup that they're a general partner, they're syndicating deals, they're raising capital from investors. They also handle some or all of their own construction. We outsource our property management to third parties. So we have four different property management companies we've worked with and that are. Uh, managing our portfolio now all, all over the country. What other kind of insurance or what other kind of risks are there that a guy like me should be looking at uh, or our audience, if they're in a similar situation or looking to grow into a similar situation, uh, what kind of insurance should they be looking at buying uh, other than you know just insuring the property itself? So there are a few things I recommend for the, the growing small and the true middle market real estate investor. So we need a certain amount of critical mass for something like this arrangement to make sense. But if we're greater than one to 200 doors, I strongly encourage a what's called tenant liability master policy or program. And this comes into play, you know, during events like we just had in the upper Midwest with our most recent freeze occurrence over the holidays. Okay. So let's say your tenant goes out of town for Christmas or the holidays. And they think, oh, I want to save money on my heat or electric bill. So I'm going to turn the heat off in my apartment. I won't be there. I don't need it. And then they come back and there's burst pipes and water all over the flooring and carpet and drywall. And you're looking at maybe $75,000. So to completely renovate that unit, bring it back up to where it was before the loss. Conventionally, that had been a loss on the building owner's property insurance policy. And that negatively affects your claims history, 
It affects your, you know, ability to renew with that company. You know, you might be forced into a, essentially a higher risk pool, a company that maybe accepts people with losses, but they make them pay for it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not good for the building owner, even though we have that insurance option that we can always turn to. But because this directly occurred because of tenant negligence, we are able to collect on the tenant liability master policy. Okay. Over the last two weeks, I've had something like 11 burst pipe losses. It's been a great time. I'm ready for spring. (laughs) Well, I was just talking to one of our property managers yesterday, Calvin. His name is Zach. And Zach manages a portfolio of about 16 buildings. um, And seven or eight of those are ours. Um, so he manages about, let's call it $75 million of asset value. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's about 450 doors. Um, he, he said he had 16, well, I don't know. He had 16 buildings. He had 11, I think it was 11 or 12 burst pipes and hundreds of heat calls. Right. Because you, you know how it was. I mean, it was 55 degrees one day mm-hmm. and three days later, it was negative 25 degrees with the windshield. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you have like pipes that are normally in a building that are pretty secure that are inside the brick, but they're within six inches of the brick. Mm-hmm. And the brick is so cold that the pipes actually froze. Right. That could be in the rafters. It could be in the, in the drop ceilings. It could be the domestic line. We had about at least four or five different uh, pipes freeze in different buildings. Mm-hmm. It's all happened on Christmas Eve and Christmas day. So Zach was real happy about that working an eight, 10 hour day on Christmas day. Um, so the tenant liability master policy mm-hmm. would not their renter's insurance cover some of that, or how, how does the renter's insurance policy? Cause we require mm-hmm. that they take renter's insurance and they can pay through it right through our por- uh, portal or they have to show proof that they bought it. And about mm-hmm. 85% of them either bought it or shown us proof. There are some that fall through the cracks, right? That mm-hmm. we don't have proof or whatever. I don't want to say it's hundred percent because this, I know it's not, it's probably 85%. So you have the building policy. Wouldn't the renter's insurance policy cover some of that damage that was caused? And then let's say they didn't buy the, 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 uh, the, the, the renter's policy, mm-hmm. then then does the tenant liability policy pop in to cover against these losses that would ultimately fall to the building? That is correct. So this is a a backstop that both protects the property owner and operator, as well as the tenant. You know, that way a property insurance company isn't trying to subrogate to them to recover their money. They would otherwise pay out in the form of a claim to the property owner. So it's a, a backstop mechanism that maintains and verifies 100% compliance in your renter's insurance slash tenant liability portfolio. And does this something the tenant liability that the owner pays for? Directly and indirectly. So the initial cost is to the property owner. The mechanism that we suggest is you have a lease agreement that stipulates you have the right to place this insurance if the tenant fails to do so at their expense. And then you pass it on in the form of a line item cost in their monthly rent invoice. So it's it's it, it's a it's a bill back to the tenant to pay to pay for that. Okay. Exactly. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. And now I had a guy approach me about creating my own insurance, essentially captive agency Mm -hmm. that would then almost self-insure, if you will, Mm -hmm. captive agency to do this. And I'm pretty sure this is exactly what he was kind of presenting to me. He said, look, you've got this critical mass. You've got these, let's say 1,000, 1,200 doors just in the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. You've got 900 doors in Houston. You got another thousand in Atlanta. He specifically said, okay, for the Cleveland portfolio, this tenant liability master policy 
that there was a, a mechanism that we could become like essentially a captive insurance agency and we're essentially paying a certain amount to ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And essentially insuring some of that possible loss. And then assuming that you don't have catastrophic claims uh, in, in a year, then there would be some sort of profit available to go back to that business. That's essentially Correct. a captive agency. So I, I kind of understand it. I'm kind of going through the process of learning about it to see if I want mm -hmm. to do this. But for those people that are part of our audience that have a significant amount of doors, why don't you explain that concept? Because the building insurance is one thing you can use Calvin for. Mm -hmm. The uh, renter's insurance, you know, we've, we've talked about that. That's pretty simple. Uh, the tenant liability policy to basically pay it as the owner, bill it back to the residents. That's another way mm -hmm. to protect. But now this could become a possible income stream, like a, a, an opportunity to profit from this. While you're in a uh, while you're the apartment owner, the operator. So Calvin, explain sort of high level again the mechanics of how that would work. Absolutely. So with the tenant liability master policy, there is a mechanism that an operator who's maybe small or medium sized, you know, they have less than a thousand doors enrolled into this program, they can profit off of that item as well. So let's say your cost might be nine dollars per door per month, and you charge. $14 per door per month. There's a $5 administrative fee baked into the cost that you're passing on to the tenant for the TLL program. So you are able to generate some ancillary income from that. And that scale, it can turn into a very healthy revenue stream, profit generating opportunity. But if we are truly medium sized or bigger, you know, we have at least a thousand doors enrolled into this program. You can form what is called a captive insurance company as a licensed insurance company that is able to, you know, pay the claims, set reserves, underwrite to their preferences and so forth. And it's a, a very fantastic mechanism for that true middle market multifamily group because you are able to profit off of not just, you know, the underwriting income. So the premium minus claims minus expenses that is generated from this activity but also much in the same way that Berkshire Hathaway made their money, you can dig into the investment income and the float that your reserves are generating during that time. So, you know, you might have a half million dollars in reserve or something like this on a medium sized account that we set up with a captive. And let's say that generates between six and 8% in safe investment grade, you know, vehicles to place our capital. We are meeting the reserve requirements set by each state where we will be operating, and we're able to get a piece of the investment income that is generated from this activity. So it's because a nice one, two, three kind of Sitting there doing nothing, what you're talking exactly. about is then having that reserve dollar actually earn uh, a rate of return, preferably in some liquid, fairly fixed um, investment vehicle. In case there is claims, we can access the money. Mm -hmm. And it's not volatile like the stock market or crypto where it's going up and down wildly, uh, but you're earning that maybe four to six to 8% kind of return. Those dollars then stay back with the owner of the captive agency, which mm -hmm. is often the general partner or the operator of the building. So it's an additional income stream while you're also insuring for this tenant liability, the, the tenant that lets their unit freeze. To that example, Calvin, I actually had a woman, she's a little older, she's a little bit of a hoarder. She actually left her windows open during that. And she was still living in the unit. Mm -hmm. And she left the windows open. I'm not sure why. And sure enough, the pipes in the in the in the in the bathroom and the pipes in the kitchen, which were obviously right next to the windows, mm -hmm. froze <laughs> in her unit while she was living in it. <laughs> so you just never know what people are gonna do. People are wild and crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but let me pivot a little bit to Airbnb insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, help help our audience understand if they have a single, a double, an apartment building, or, you know, a complex of Airbnbs. Uh, is that complex? I don't do a lot of Airbnbs. I've owned a few from time to time. I do own an apartment building downtown Cleveland that we're converting a few units into Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. um, but w w what's there to look out for, if anything, regarding ensuring the Airbnbs where you have traffic coming and going, you have people doing staying for one night or a week, versus tenants that are staying for 12 months at a time? So the one to four family short-term rental segment is 
fairly simple to place insurance for. There's a number of different companies offering coverage, you know, entertaining that segment of real estate. And we we write nationally, I want to say probably around 600 doors in our short-term rentals. So it's, you need a specialized product that is explicitly friendly with the short-term nature of your tenancy. However, it's not incredibly difficult to place insurance for a, a smaller building that is used for the purpose of short-term rentals. Now with the true multifamily, five plus doors, that is where things can become much trickier and much more gray very quickly. And with the apartment segment specifically, you know, if the vast majority of our units, more than 50% are short-term rentals, there are some classifications that you can use. You know, you can chat with your insurance company underwriter and ask if maybe a hotel, motel classification would suffice. And most often they will agree with that because the exposure presented by a hotel or motel is not dissimilar to what you might find with a short-term rental. However, if you have an apartment building with, let's say, 20 units and five of those are short-term rentals, it puts us into essentially a no-man's land mm. where it's insurance companies, they do not like having an apartment policy where there is short-term rental contained there within. And if it's not greater than 50% of the units, you can't really call it a hotel either. So how do you approach that? Well, you make a justification to your underwriter that this is a incidental exposure to the short-term rental. And that's not the primary focus or usage of the building. And it's more or less placed on a case-by-case -case basis. And one mechanism that you can use to further muddy the waters in your favor as the operator is to lease those units to a different entity that you control. And then you sublease those units out on the short-term rental platforms like Airbnb. Got it. Got it. Okay. So if I was to, which I'm going to do this, you know, one or two units inside of this 41 unit building, mm -hmm. um, is that even something that I really need to bring up to the, with, with only being one or two units, like less than 5% of the building? Or is it something I should bring up and justify to the underwriter and say, well, listen, this is a full market rate, downtown, regular apartment building. However, we've got these one or two units that we're mm -hmm. leasing on Airbnb. Are they even going to care? Do they want to know? Is it something we should disclose and justify to them? And then they're going to maybe modify the policy slightly or add a rider to it? How would that work? I think it's a good idea to bring to your broker's attention. You know, some companies are, they do not have any policy language that's hostile to the short-term rental activity. So you're not going to find an exclusion or anything like that with many companies, but it is against the guidelines with the vast majority of companies. So they will come and yell at the broker like, hey, why'd you write this apartment building that has some Airbnb activity going on inside. Yeah. So I think it's good to be transparent and forthcoming, more so to prevent any exclusions that could be prevalent. Some companies do exclude, for example, liability arising from short-term rental activities. So it's good to get ahead of that. That way, you know how the cards are laid out and you can make adjustments accordingly versus having this come up after the loss occurs. And then we find out, oh no, we don't have coverage for liability. And you know, this Airbnb tenant is suing us because they slipped and fell walking into their unit. So it's, it's good to be very proactive in that sense. Got it, I love it, sounds great. Listen, Calvin, I, I really enjoyed this conversation, especially because of our portfolio and some of the recent mm -hmm. craziness with these catastrophic losses. Is there any other words of advice or things as we wrap up here today that you sh would really like our audience to know either about you, about your firm, or about how they should be looking at insurance for their buildings? One of the biggest things that I pushed for my clients to adopt as a best practice in recent years would be really two things. One, we should have certain contractual risk transfer agreements in both our tenant and our contractor agreement contracts. So on the tenant side, for an example, we should require that if the tenant has a vehicle that they'll be parking on premises, you know, maybe we have a parking lot adjacent to this building, we should have a explicit contractual disclaimer of liability 
drafted with council opinion and assistance that states if the tenant's personal auto is stolen or a tree branch falls on it during a windstorm or another car backs into it and then leaves the scene that we the operator are explicitly not liable for that and i i drive that opinion from performing case studies on a multitude of middle market multifamily groups for example locally we have mckinley properties of ann arbor washington county they're uh, a very healthy mid-market multifamily group in Michigan and Florida with around 6,000 doors, been active for right around six decades. Mm. And reading through their tenant lease agreement, they have a portion that explicitly disclaims liability from you know whatever may happen to a tenant's personal auto that's stored on premises. Great advice. Things happen, tree branches fall, people back into people. And as crazy as it sounds, cars get stolen even from the best areas. Mm-hmm. I mean, A class, B class, it's not like it just happens in the hood. I mean, cars get stolen. Um, and as a matter of fact, I heard, I don't even know if, I don't know if it was true, but the Alfa Romeo dealership that's up mm-hmm. the street from me had 20 vehicles stolen at yeah. four in the morning the other day. Um, I have to yet to verify whether that's true, but to think that 20 Alfa Romeos could get stolen in at one time is obviously a very coordinated network of thieves and bad guys. Mm-hmm. And if that can happen at an Alfa Romeo dealership, you bet your butt it's gonna, it can happen at your apartment complex. Oh, yeah. I mean, organized crime groups, they they hold back. They do not hold back, excuse me, in terms of where they will take action and, you know, commit bad things. So just because you're investing in a very nice community with a Class A or a Class B building does not mean that we are safe from something like that happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, let's say maybe the tenant neglected their duty to buy comprehensive and collision coverage insurance for their personal auto. You know, if you're looking at either not being able to get to work or having a, a lender, a bank, barking at you because you still owe them 25 grand on the loan, now you don't right. have a car, you know, that tenant is going to be directly incentivized to come pointing fingers every which direction. Yeah, why didn't you have more security cameras? Why didn't you have a right. gate out front? Why didn't you have blah, 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 blah? It's not my fault. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sue the operator for the loss of my vehicle because I didn't have the right insurance or didn't pay my insurance or it wasn't exactly. covered or whatever. You know, they forgot to pay their bill at renewal. Kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, if that were to occur, the first thing that their attorney is going to ask for is a copy of the tenant lease agreement to see who is contractually liable if it's mentioned. And when the attorney reviews that lease agreement and sees that there is an explicit disclaimer, it will hopefully dismotivate 90% of, you know, potential affected parties from taking action against us. Yeah. Now you mentioned there was a second one. You mentioned the tenant transfer of risk. What was the second one you mentioned? So this would be a contractor that we have come work on our, you know, property, a best practice for something like that. And I'll use a real world example of something that we just had happen a week ago now. Whenever you have a contractor come out to your property, you know, maybe they're cutting down a tree or they're, you know, working on plumbing or installing an alarm notification system for your fire suppression system. You need to make sure that you have a general liability certificate naming yourself as a additional insured. And I also think it's a good idea to request the workers' compensation insurance certificate. And the GL will come into play because what if that alarm monitoring system fills your fire suppression system, which regularly does not have water in it. You know, we know that from an inspector coming out over the summer that there was no water in the sprinkler system. It's a super old school system, Mm -hmm. you know, where it fills on demand versus having sitting water in it, like most modern sprinklers might have. Let's say that your building is in a, a more challenging market, like maybe Detroit or Toledo. And, you know, you have a issue with vacancy in the building to where insurance companies don't want to offer all peril, as they call it, or special form cause of loss, where everything that is not specifically excluded finds coverage. Mm-hmm. We only have basic form where they cover, you know, 14 named perils and nothing more. So what happens if you have that alarm monitoring system come out and they fail to do their duty to drain those fire suppression lines after they perform a test on the system. You know, they leave water sitting 
and then we have a freeze event like we just had a week ago and we end up with burst pipes throughout the building well our insurance <laughs> exactly it was a, a real world example of something we just went through and are working through presently but the story on this is an alarm monitoring company was hired they came out you know installed a monitoring system for the fire suppression system they filled the lines with water to make sure that they were you know structurally sound and then they forgot to drain them they do mostly residential type alarm installation and this large commercial building was just outside of their experience and expertise and they made a boo-boo and because the building is majority vacant we only have basic form cause of loss on the building i you know threw spaghetti at the wall hit yeah. up over 100 insurance companies and that's all that we could return insurance companies aren't big on you know paying claims that they reasonably expect to happen something like this on a vacant building is reasonable to anticipate from their front and you know how insurance companies are right so we're in a scenario now where a contractor you know based on the way that we interpret events has resulted in direct financial damage to my client and they cannot recover from their insurance company because it's not a covered peril mm. so we have to file a claim on the contractor's policy because we know that there was no water in the lines prior to them taking action about a month ago when they installed this system. And as a result, you know, they failed to do their duty. It caused financial harm to my client. They, in my opinion, are liable. So we file a claim against them. And that's why having that certificate is important for you. Yeah, having that cert being a second named uh, on that is, is huge. Mm -hmm. That's great stuff, Calvin. Um, I actually was in the financial services world and my dad was in property and casualty for a long time and pivoted over to uh, doing um, employee benefits mm -hmm. and employee benefits, uh, health insurance shop and uh, benefits shop for a long time. So uh, I, I, I value these kind of conversations a lot. Insurance is always evolving, especially with inflation, especially with these catastrophic events happening this opportunity to do a captive type of program. Mm -hmm. Those are all changing and evolving. Uh, so, Calvin, if, if our audience wants to reach out to you, get insurance for their building, talk about some of the things we talked about today on the show, uh, where can they reach out to you? What's your website, phone number? How can they get a hold of you? So we're at www.falconins, short for insurance, agency.com. I am Calvin, C-A-L-V-I-N, like Calvin Klein, <laughs> at falconinsagency.com. And our direct line is 734-887-9110. I'm also extremely responsive on Facebook, LinkedIn, email, your preferred method of communication. I'm always available. Awesome stuff, Calvin. Listen, thanks so much for carving out some time today. Have a great and happy and successful 2023. And uh, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate your insights. Oh, of course. Thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate that. Well, there you have it, guys. Listen, uh, that was a great interview to start out 2023. Uh, to talk specifically about some of those insurance concepts with Calvin. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and push down right now on the subscribe button. Uh, make sure that you leave us a five-star rating and review. I always appreciate those. We've gotten hundreds and hundreds of reviews for the show, hundreds and hundreds of our new subscribers, members. Uh, and also, guys, listen, don't forget that in 2023, we're going to be hosting what we call the Forever Passive Income Live event. The Forever Passive Income Live event is going to be held a pretty much on a monthly basis or a bi-monthly basis, which is where I'll teach for three days my best strategies for investing in multifamily, specifically in this new upcoming market where we'll be fighting against a recession. There's going to be more foreclosures. There's going to be more receivership deals and lower prices and better opportunity for all of you. So if you are finally ready to jump in and really learn all of my best techniques and strategies and do it for three straight days and kind of learn, you know, fire hose, man, drink out of the fire hose and get all that information, go to foreverpassiveincome.com and go ahead and grab a ticket. Tickets are only a few hundred bucks. We run specials from time to time, which actually get you a better price than that. And there you'll learn exactly how to buy multifamily, how to acquire them, how to raise the capital, how to structure your insurance like we talked about today, how to ex execute the CapEx, increase the value of your buildings, just like 220 Chevy, a building that I bought for $11.65 that today would appraise for over $18 million 
with over $5 million of equity. I'll teach you exactly how to do that at foreverpassiveincome.com. We'll see you next time on the show. Take care. You were just listening to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us build the AI community by leaving a review and five-star rating on our iTunes podcast channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. To see passive investing opportunities, visit freelandventures.com slash passive. To start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of with multifamily apartments, apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Josh at www.joshcantwellcoaching.com.